So then with that, we're going to bring on our next guest, Justice Whitethorn. Hello. Thank you for uh, coming on the show. It's yeah. great to have you yeah. here. Great to be here. Thank and, you and this is Jeff's uh, first time around uh, on the show. So uh, see you, Justice. have you guys met before? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, a couple times before. Yeah. So what do you think about uh, Jeff Johnson's uh, latest ad here? Do, do you like it? Uh, do you think it, it hits, hits Dayton where it needs to? Uh, no, I, I don't think it's quite as powerful enough. I, I do think that... Uh, you know, Dayton is really just led with his chin on this. I mean, the Minshore is a complete and utter failure, and uh, the, any type of defense for it is indefensible. So I think that there's plenty of plenty more damage and plenty more truth that could have been told. You only have so much time in that. So, now, in that, in my that understanding, program. your opponent is Leon Lilly. Yes. He was a co-sponsor of the yep. bill that gave us Minshew. That not? is correct. He's not simply uh, didn't simply vote for it, but he actually one of the co-sponsors on that bill. So is so. he uh, getting a lot of pushback from his uh, constituents in his district? Have you heard a lot of people talking about I, uh, Minshew? <laughs> I have, as a matter of fact. Um, and so as I'm going out talking on doors. Uh, the, the people that, if they want to say anything at all, uh, there's a couple things that are consistent. But one thing uh, that people are upset at is the fact that their health insurance is going up. Now there is an exception, and that is uh, if their health insurance didn't go up, which is more likely if they were working for the government and got their insurance from the government. But as far as uh, private insurance, uh, the private insurance has gone up. In Goodhue County, the average uh, insurance for women uh, on private insurance is 200%. Mm -hmm. All right, that's according to the Manhattan Institute. And 200%, oh my goodness, what, what does Mark Dayton have against uh, women in Goodhue County? So the same study cites that average uh, premiums for everyone having private insurance in Minnesota has increased 47%. Now another huge problem that we have is even if you get on Minsure, your deductibles are so high that you essentially can't afford to use it. So if you got the bronze plan, we're talking, you know, five thousand dollar deductible. So the fact that you have insurance but you can't afford to go to the hospital because you can't afford to pay the deductible means in all practically Practically speaking, you really don't have insurance. Well, let's uh, let's get into that issue then. Um, I know during the governor's primary, they all had slightly different takes on what to do about Minsure. I know that Scott Honor said that we mm -hmm. should scrap it and go into the federal system. Uh, others kind of just said we need to. They didn't really have a position on it because right. it's easy to talk about the uh, problems with Minsure, but we're in a way stuck with it because of the federal law and, and because this whole thing's been created. Yeah. So. <coughs> If it's in your hands, Justice, what are you going to do about it? Well, uh, first of all, we need to acknowledge the incredible extent of damage that has been done to the healthcare industry because of this. And you're absolutely right. Getting rid of it is going to be very, very difficult because it is so deeply entrenched in the infrastructure that uh, simply going back to the old way, uh, which would, if, if we simply went back to the old way, our Health insurance costs would go down, and the quality of our health insurance and our health care would go up. And that's if we just went back to what we had before. And we know that because uh, since we've had Minsure, uh, the costs of our insurance have increased, and simultaneously, the quality of insurance has gone down. Uh, so if, if all we did was go back to the, the way that we had it before, um, it would be better. It would be a, more affordable than it is right now. The, the way that people are measuring affordable care, I, I don't know how that, uh, what is affordable about it. It may be affordable to the small percentage of people who are getting 100% subsidies. But if you create a program called Make Friends with Minnesota, while well, you take uh, for every 100 Minnesotans, you punch 99 in the face and then you shake hands with one, you're always gonna be able to find one in 100 <laughs> that says, hey, uh, hey, hey, it's not so bad. You've got to shake, shake yep. hands with one, so uh, yep. you know, this okay. is the shake hands with Minnesota This is the shake day. hands. Okay, now <laughs> you, you uh, who voted for this program, you're going to be able to hey, find one me. person <laughs> who says, okay, punch hey, me this in the program's face not so bad. <laughs> this program's not so bad. Well, the majority of the people are screaming, this is not a good program. This uh, Now, uh, if I had uh, done the the mistake of bringing this to Minnesota, I would make sure that my commercials focus on that one in 100 who says, hey, this program's mm -hmm. not so bad. Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is, uh, it's really not a very good program. So mm -hmm. now with the federal law in place, 
where do we go from here? How do we get this back on the rails, knowing that we still have that federal law that we, you, you can't just do right. what Eric Holder suggests and just ignore the laws that you don't like. You know, we got to up, up, uh, uphold, you know, the Obamacare legislation. At the same time, you know, we still have a broken system here. So what are your thoughts and opinions and policies on changing that? Well, the extent to which it is possible to keep it out of Minnesota needs to be put into place. So, yes, we can't keep it all out. Uh, but the last thing in the world we want to do is bring it in. It, it's like a Trojan horse. I mean, it sounds nice on the outside. Um, who would be against affordable care, right? But once you get that inside, bring that Trojan horse inside the gates of Minnesota and find out that what's actually inside that Trojan horse really isn't that good, well, we probably should have kept the, as much of it as we could out. Uh, so that's the challenge. How much of it, uh, how much of the terrible things that we are seeing can we keep out of Minnesota? So I'm on your uh, website right now, Dallas. If we can pop it up, it's whitethornforhouse.com, uh, whitethornforhouse.com. Uh, Jeffrey had mentioned that you're running against uh, Rep Representative Leon Lilly, yep. uh, who's uh, former State Senator Ted Lilly's twin brother, correct? Mm -hmm. See the one that the doctor dropped at uh, <laughs> But uh. I'm just kidding. Uh, so I, I guess we'll have to ask Ted for that one. <laughs> yeah. mm. Uh, what's your district? Where is it? It's 43B. Uh, okay. It's uh, Oakdale, uh, everything in Oakdale north of um, 10th Street, um, all of nor North St. Paul, and there's uh, two districts in Maplewood. Mm -hmm. And so it's primarily composed of working class Minnesotans then? Yep. Right. So, okay. And then have you had a chance to uh, debate uh, Mr. Lilly? Unfortunately, I have not, although the League of Women Voters uh, offered me an invitation, which I enthusiastically in accepted. But on, on October 8th, the, the debate was scheduled for October mm -hmm. 20th. On October 8th, I received notice that uh, due to lack of candidate participation, the debate was canceled. Mm. So. Uh, there, one other factor was cited. So, what, what so what lack of candidate participation, and you enthusiastically yes. wanted to participate. So I am assuming that it was that your opponent was unenthusiastic about that and decided not to. <laughs> Perhaps, but uh, I wasn't. Uh, Leon and I weren't the other ones invited. Uh, Stacy Stout and Peter Fisher were also invited. So District 42A and 43B. Uh, uh, 42A and 42B uh, and um, 43B were invited. Yeah, yeah I was just going to say, I've had a, a few shows on in the past about just mm -hmm. uh, the progression or regression of political debate in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I did a whole show showing these great historic debates that have taken place in our great state, former governor's debates, U.S. And I'm just shocked that this is the first year where the Democrats, uh, the incumbents have said, no, nope, we're not going to do the NPR state fair debate. Right. Uh, we're only going to do a very limited amount. Uh, I've heard it arrogantly stated that we don't need to have this many debates. You know, like somehow we get bored of hearing them go on the record talking about the issues and having to defend mm. their record as well. And, and do you think that this is a problem? I, I, I do. And, you know, whatever the governor wants to say about his, he, he, he could say he doesn't want this many debates, and Al Franken can say he doesn't want this many debates. But uh, my opponent and I have only had one debate scheduled. That's the only opportunity that we have. So it's not like yeah. uh, he and I have had right. uh, several opportunities. Right. I mean, have you ever a, met your opponent on the campaign trail? Uh, well, not on the campaign trail, no. I, as I'm out knocking doors, I haven't seen him. Uh, no, I haven't seen him I, at all. I've met him several times, and uh, to his credit, he is uh, quite the gentleman. And uh, yeah. I have, every interaction that I've had with him has been very pleasant, uh, although he won't allow me to get my picture taken with him for some reason. Uh, <laughs> but I hope that uh, perhaps when this is over, he'll allow me to get my, my picture taken with him. Did he make any sort of uh, outreach as far as like why he's not going to take part in this debate? Because to me, it's just like you mentioned, there's only one debate. Yeah, right. Um, it's on October 20th. You really should be in town. Well, I, I want to be election's clear, coming up. I do not know that Leon refused okay. to. Okay. participate in the debate. Uh, I just know that um, the League of Women Voters uh, told me that it was canceled due to a lack of candidate participation. Yeah. There was one other thing that was cited, the fact that um, Stacy Stout's district had more than one debate already scheduled. Mm -hmm. S so that was another issue and well, you know, that that district already has debates, so mm -hmm. perhaps they don't need another one. So perhaps we can make a challenge? 
to have a debate right on this show? Yes, yes, we can certainly do that. Tony, your you thoughts? We can make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I guess this is an open invitation to Leon Lilly to come on this show for a uh, debate or forum or discussion yep. uh, with the two candidates and us. Yep, and we'll give uh, them the questions ahead of time so you guys can study them. And, that would be fair. Know, I, don't think it, I don't think a debate has to be these questions that pop out of nowhere. I actually think it's better if the people can know the questions ahead of time so that they can actually prepare. A good so, answer. Leon Lilly, if you are watching, open invitation. And really, we hope that you will accept this invitation. Justice Whitethorn has already said he's going to accept that invitation. And we just want to hear from you because we think this would be great for the voters of 43B to get to know who both of you are. Yep. And, and if and they I'll want a, a different moderator, we'll so that, that way that happen too. That would work him. too. Yeah. yeah, we can get a, we can get an independent moderator to, to do the debate because this isn't about a, a gotcha moment nope. or anything like this. It's just simply the voters of your district deserve mm -hmm. to hear where he stands and where you stand so that they can make an, an educated decision. I mean, you've mentioned you've been door knocking a ton. There's only a, right. there's only a certain amount of people that actually open the door. You know, there's some people yeah. who you, you mm -hmm. can't reach through the door. You may need to reach through a debate or through a newspaper ad or article or something like that. But can you talk a little bit about, um, I think anyone who, who's a conservative or uh, like Lena, a third party candidate mm -hmm. in the urban core, uh, one thing that unifies us all is that we're running against the machine, yes. uh, the Democrat <laughs> machine, the union machine, the big uh, crony capitalist machine that essentially runs the, the Twin Cities here. Uh, it skews our entire state because this is actually a center-right conservative state, mm -hmm. but uh, Twin Cities and, and, and Duluth basically anchor us down. Um, how do you overcome the, these challenges as a, uh, as a, a conservative candidate? Well, after I got out of the Marine Corps, um, I started, I became a national consultant on poverty in America. And so uh, organizations paid me to tell them, uh, to give them my opinion. That's, that's the nice thing about being uh, a consultant. And what they wanted my expertise on, they wanted my opinion on what do we do about poverty in America. So all of the research that exists on poverty can be fall into one of four categories. So another way to say that is uh, poverty is caused by one of four things. It could be behaviors of the individual. There's plenty of research that prove that yes, um, the individual's behaviors do indeed contribute to poverty or wealth. Another one is lack of human uh, social capital. So uh, if your father is a great business person, chances are that you will also be a great business person or you have a greater percentage chance of becoming a great business person as well. However, if you're born and raised in generational poverty and your, your family uh, knows the welfare system, well, that's something that you know and so the chances are that you also will be in poverty. So the third one is uh, human exploitation and this is where all of the uh, isms fall in, whether it's racism or sexism or classism. There's a, a great body of research that validates the fact that, uh, yes, those isms do indeed cause poverty. And then the last one is political and economic structures. Mm -hmm. So the politicians that create the policies, some of these policies may actually lead to poverty. So think of uh, communism, think of the former Soviet Union. There's a lot of politicians over there, there's a lot of policies. The policies didn't, didn't exactly stimulate the economy, you want to say. So what we have to do is we have to be aware of to what extent uh, each one of these four things are playing in the community. And that's how you fix the system. But if you don't know those four things and you don't know a little bit about systems engineering, then it's not going to matter. So for example, we can take uh, the fact that uh, a lot of minority children are on free and reduced lunch. Uh, so what is that telling us then? Is that telling us that the, the political and economic structures are not working? Maybe, uh, because political and economic structures do indeed cause poverty or cause wealth, but it may also be lack of human uh, um, and social capital. It may also be because of exploitation. So if someone says, because uh, children and minorities have a higher percentage of being on free and reduced lunch, therefore we have proof that racism exists. Well, the answer is maybe. 
maybe the reason that they're on free and reduced lunch is because of racism, but it also might be individual behavior. It also might be lack of human and social capital. It also might be political and economic structures. Hmm. Unfortunately, we have our, in our present system, special interest groups and individuals who have a favorite cause of poverty are uh, arguing and, and grabbing at the pool of money that the government say uh, is offering. And so if we think of everybody in Minnesota in a boat, and the boat has four holes in it, and one special interest group is saying the government needs to give money because uh, we need to get rid of sexism. And, and yes, we certainly need to get rid of sexism. But another one is saying the government needs to, to give us money because we need to help the individual. Yes, that's absolutely true. But if we allow ourselves to have a favorite cause, even if we were able to end all the sexism and end all the racism and fix the heads of, of any individual in generational poverty or situational poverty, we still have other holes in the boat. So even if we could fix one of those causes, if we're talking about how do we end poverty, the boat is still going to sink. Hmm. So we need to make sure that we address all four holes in our boat. And if we don't, not only uh, are the individuals in poverty going down, but we're all going down because we're all in the same boat together. Well, Justice, we're uh, coming to the end of our time here, end of the, the show, but I wanted to give you the last uh, 10, 15 seconds just to tell everyone how they can help in your website. Uh, well, you can go to whitethornforhouse.com and uh, when, first of all, I've got about 50 articles that are on there, so make sure you take a look at that, and then go to facebook.com slash whitethorn for house and click the like button. Justice Whitethorn, thank you for coming on. Jeff, thanks, uh, thanks for coming for on the first show. Please join us again. This is the Tony Hernandez Show. We broadcast live every Saturday from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock, SEC Television Studios. May God bless you. May God bless America. And bye, Dios. <laughs>